Thank you, band. I'd like to welcome you on this last Wednesday of the month of September. Can you guys believe it? Wow. The year is almost gone. So I'd like to welcome everyone here in the auditorium and those of you at home to the forum. The forum is a, a place, a platform where we come together on the last Wednesday of the month to talk about the theme of the month that we've been, all the, the theme that we've been discussing in Bible study over the past few weeks. And so tonight we, we get to um, do that. And I, I always look forward to it, so I hope you are excited as well because the teaching this month, although the topic may have been a bit scary, not something we're very used to, but it really was a blessing to me. It's been a blessing to me just listening to this series. So without further ado, I'd like us to go ahead and welcome our, our ministers for this month who blessed us richly in the word of the Lord. So I'd like to go ahead and welcome Minister Emmanuel to the audit to the seat. <laughs> go ahead and come up. Let's give let's celebrate God in his life if you were blessed. And then of course our very own Deacon Uche. Certainly not last. Last but not least rather. <laughs> yeah, he's last. Calling him last, but he's definitely not the least. He is a set man over this house, Pastor Kola Olalea. So I always, we always encourage everyone to send in your questions, whether you're worshiping or um, watching from home. Send in your questions. It's not too late. We can still take them. And if you're here in the auditorium, you can still let, um, text in your questions. I, I believe everyone received the link over the course of the, la uh, the month, actually where you can send in your questions. So please, let's do that. Hallelujah. Oh, wow. <laughs> All the questions will come to you. <laughs> well, you may be right, actually, about that. Praise the Lord. So this month, we the series for the month, Pastor Kola kicked off, was it's good news. It's the good news. Reaching our world for Christ. Praise the Lord. And he started off just looking at a couple of anchor scriptures for the month. Let's go to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. We'll go ahead and read Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. All right, so I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and read while we wait for technical. It says, "So this was Jesus speaking to his disciples, and I'll st start from 18 actually." Thank you, sir. And he said, "Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, "All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father." of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all, the, all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So this was Jesus here giving the disciples what is known as the Great Commission, right? Telling them this is the ultimate purpose, as we were told. You know, it's interesting. Before this, Jesus called them. They were all fishes of men. Then he called them, and he said, I believe it was earlier, in the, in the chapters before, he said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow and then fish. So Jesus is telling them here, you've been following me, now I want you to go and fish. Praise the Lord. Let's read, I'm not preaching, I promise. Let's read Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Praise the Lord. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So Jesus basically is telling them this. Go and teach. Go and make disciples of every creature. So Pastor Kola, when you kicked it off, you I love how you um, started off talking about what is evangelism. Really first talking about Jesus passing on the baton. I thought that was pretty neat. You, you read in from John chapter 17, verse 9, where Jesus was saying, you know, I have done the work, what my father sent me to do, now I'm sending you. So Jesus is saying, hey, 
I have done my part. Now, do yours. Essentially completing that, you know, he's done the hardest part, which was dying for us, right? He was going to do that, and he's back passing on the baton to us. Can you just maybe just go a little bit and, and shed light on that, maybe ex expand on that for those who may have missed it, why that whole series of passing on the baton? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you know, I started or just in a nutshell, what I said is sometimes the fact that we're saved, and I'm going to go back to that, the fact that we're saved, uh, if that was all that it was about life, then we have attained everything, then we can go ahead and just go to heaven in that regard. But that's not what it is. The scripture was clear when, and Jesus said the same thing, everyone who's understood and has been saved and understood and has understood what it means to be a believer full of Christ has an assignment built into your new calling and that assignment is that we need to go and share the gospel to the rest of the world that God we are the hands and feet that carry the message across in John chapter 17 where Jesus was really kind of giving his um sort of his uh, summary of what he did. He came back and said, listen, Lord, you, just as you have sent me, uh, I, I, and you've kept me, I'm in you, I've fulfilled everything, and everything you give to me, I have not lost any one of them. I have kept them, I have kept it. And that was the same thing that Paul did, where he says, I have kept the faith, I've run the race, I've kept the faith, which was, they, they knew why they were there. They knew what purpose they were on earth for. And so what Jesus did was, he now said to the disciples, he now said to God, listen, I'm passing on this baton to those people, but you got to be with them. And interesting thing, I so, I so, I so was mesmerized by this point. He said, I pray not only for these people, for ev but for everyone who will be saved because of these people. Kind of validates the fact that God has already prayed for somebody you have not yet shared the gospel with, if you understand. He's already prayed for them. Jesus already prayed for someone you have not shared the gospel with. So the question is, the, the, the prayer has gone forth. The question is, what are we doing? And, 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 and how are we lagging behind with that? So that's in a nutshell. Thank you very much. So then Minister Emmanuel went on. He dug a little deeper. He took us on a law school lecture, <laughs> telling us about, you know, the four truths. He, he talked about re how we can reach our word for Christ. And you started up by saying, you know, evangelism is not you're going to hell or, you, you know, if you don't receive Christ, right? I think a lot of people, you know, were probably, you've heard that, you know, at some point in your life or before you even gave your life to Christ. But you said it's about the love of God. Can you just expand a little bit on that? Thank you. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, uh, there's a lot of people who believe that if... If God truly loves us, then why the condemnation, right? But the way I look at it is if you if you read the most popular scripture, which is John three sixteen in the Bible that everyone knows, is that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now the message of the message of the gospel is really about the love of God and not necessarily the condemnation. The condemnation for me, is the consequences of not accepting the gospel. So what, what, what Jesus came to this world to do was to die for us because God loves us so much. And, you know, I think that it is important that we spread the gospel of the love of God beyond the consequences because the consequences does not come before the message. The message is truly about the love of God. And Jesus said, that, you know, Scripture tells us that before we even gave our life to Christ, that God loves us. So for why we were yet seen as Christ died for us. And he went further to say, I, I believe that was in um, um, 1 John chapter 4. It went further to say that if God would love us so much, even in our, you know, messy state, in the times where we disobey, then we should go on to show that love to others. So I believe that truly, yes, the gospel is really about the love of God because, you know, think about it. Who would give their most precious possession or, you know, your only child? Scripture describes Jesus as God's only begotten son. And, you know, like I was preaching the other day, 
Jesus is part of God. So when we talk about God giving us his only begotten son, truly, he, God was giving part of himself back to man just to restore. So the gospel is truly about the love of Christ. But the condemnation in the anchor scripture for the month, which is um, Mark 16, 15, it went further to say that anyone who do not accept the gospel, then condemnation comes. But condemnation is not the gospel. It's not the news. The news is that Jesus Christ loved us so much. I mean, God loved us so much that he will send Christ to share his blood. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And then Deacon Uche concluded the series last week about, I think, I believe his topic was initiating the conversation. You know, a lot of times, and I appreciate what you did with that in that message, because a lot of times people go about thinking, um, I just give a tract and that's, that's all there is. But there's so many, many of us don't do that, right? Does that, that, does that mean we can't evangelize? Does that mean that's the only way to evangelize? But you shed some light on different approaches to evangelizing. Can you just, for those who maybe may have missed it, kind of give us a summary and about that, really? Yeah, sure. So um, there's actually, a, a, not a, a quote, but it's a, it's, a, it's a saying that was attributed to, I think, Francis of Assisi. And it turns out that he never did say that, right? The one that goes, because it, it, it was very convenient, right, to pass the message of more or less copying out when it comes to evangelizing, which is, um, you know, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. You know, there's a, there's a value in that, don't get me wrong, because it speaks to a different thing. But bottom line about God, the gospel and, you know, the good news and salvation is about relationships. You know, and it's difficult to build a lasting relationship or any meaningful relationship when there's no interaction or communication or just conversation. So it's important that we learn um, how, you know, the different ways we can explore interacting with people and then finding the opportunity to share. Because it's when I started having a conversation with you and talking about, you know, Nimpot Choir, like different things that you, a door opens for me to now maybe sow a seed or to water a seed or to harvest, harvest something that has been planted. You know, so relation, relational interactions, you know, like going out of your way to relate with people. We saw the example in John 4, where Christ put himself in what would be considered uncomfortable situations so that he would create opportunities to preach. You know, one of the things I talked about as well is the importance for us as Christians not to be stuck in the hospital. If, as a doctor, you know, if all you do is stay with all fellow doctors and heal the people and all you see are heal the people, then you're not really impacting um, you know, the world for the training that you got. So it's important that we fight, put ourselves in places that offers more opportunities for us to interact with people that need the saving. You know, so going out of your way, building relationships with those close to you, finding those uh, awkward situations where you can um, share the gospel, I think is very important. You know, but ultimately it's important that we use, you know, conversational, you know, tactics or approaches to do that as well and to buttress what Christ has called us to do. Awesome. Thank you so much for giving us brief info or brief summaries about your topics. Now, Pastor Carl, I'll go back to you. When you started, you essentially asked or defined what the good news is. You said it's essentially, you know, as it was in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, essentially Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. Why is that important? Why is that the good news? So if someone's here saying, well, why would I say that is the good news? I mean, Jesus died, he was buried. What is the significance of that? Why does that matter to me? Why should I care? So, so uh, <clears throat> because everything that was made available was made available to those who believe in those things. Everything God has, you know, everything he, he came to, Jesus came to show us what is available for us being believers but you see the believer it was if it was available for everybody then everybody should have attained to it everyone should have received it but it was made available so that those who are now available those who are not able to receive it are those who have understood what the message 
of God is the gospel. And if we cannot understand, let's, let's go back to the beginning of this. In John chapter 3, where Jesus said to them, he said, uh, I'm going to read just a couple of verses. John chapter 3, we know verse uh, 3, uh, said, as Jesus answered him and said, unless one is what? Born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Being born again is the first thing that allows us to see of the kingdom. And what does it mean to be born again? In Romans chapter 10, defines it says to confess with your heart and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord uh, and, and is God. It says what it means to be born again. And the only way to believe that what, that, what that means is that he came in the flesh. In the book of John, uh, first, first or second John talks talk about the fact that you have to believe that Jesus came in the flesh, died for you, and gave you access to now see, experience, and encounter all that God has for you on earth. So the gospel is first and foremost the ability to understand how you cross the threshold into all that God has given to you. Now, in John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, uh, Unless man be born again, he cannot, uh, no, sorry, enter the kingdom of God. Verse 6. Uh, so let's go from verse 3, going down to verse 3, verse 4. Um, how can a man be born again? You cannot accept this, you know, verse 5. Let's go, we know this. And then it says that, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. If you read First John chapter 5, from verse 10 to 17, the scripture talks about the three that bear witness in heaven. God the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Then it says the three that bear witness on earth, the water, the blood, and the Spirit. So he says, unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, which is unless you are born again truly, not because, says, because following down, it says, whoever is born of a flesh, whatever is born of flesh is of a flesh, but whatever is born of a Spirit, and being born of a Spirit comes from you being born again and you accepting the fact that Jesus came and he died for us. He lived, he died for us, he loved us enough, and he rose again. The resurrection, the thing that separates all religions, Christianity from all other religion, is the resurrection. And because of the resurrection, we have access. We can believe that Jesus is alive. And so everything he told us, we know it is true because he said he goes to his father and he's alive. So that, that just sets a, a benchmark. We cannot receive everything for which he paid for until we understand what the gospel is. Praise the Lord. Thank you Hallelujah. so much for that. At the end of your session, Pastor Kola, you essentially, you ended with that video with Muhammad Ali. And essentially, maybe you stated that it starts with me, right? It starts with you. How, like, if you can speak to the platforms that we have. Yeah. Um, who? Because he had a platform, right? Yes, he did. And well, even I, as a non-believer, he was I, able to get that message across. Right, and and that's the interesting thing. I believe every one of us has got a platform, and the platform. Let's look at John the John the Baptist's platform. It was somewhere in the wilderness. Nobody knew him. He, but he was still seeing the message, teaching the message that there's one that comes, uh, that comes, and and he's talking about the Jesus coming, and now. And tell people repent for the kingdom of God is in the hand and talks about that. Now, that was a platform. Every one of us as believers have a platform, whether in your home, your neighbor, um, your career, your job, your businesses. If you relate with somebody and we're created to be relational beings, we have a platform. Now, the challenge is we may not have a Muhammad Ali platform. Uh, we may, people have better platforms than Muhammad Ali, but are not sharing the gospel. They're hiding the gospel on earth. They're hiding the belief system on the earth. Now, the question is, uh, Jesus says that to whom much is given, much, much is expected. It says he was faithful and little. That's what I'm looking for. We will much more be committed unto him. If we want to really start to um, uh, utilize a platform, it has to be from now. When you're going to become, all of us are going to be great in the future. If tomorrow he becomes the new Bill Gates and he becomes the new whoever he wants to become, the new Johnny Carr or Cochran, uh, but uh, but he becomes the new the new whoever that lawyer is, 
He said the new Emmanuel. If he becomes a new person, the question is, the point is, you've always had a platform all along. You don't get there and start to, if you don't share it now, you, even if the platform was given to you today, you wouldn't share the gospel. So God was saying, start where we are, start with the people you have with you, and that's your first platform, and then you begin to grow with that. So start if, with your if, platform. If you God. let me just add something really quick. I don't think that um, Muhammad Ali said that for the first time because it was a big stage. So I'm just buttressing what Pastor was saying. He must have started saying that one on one with the people he had contact with to have the boldness to say that on the world stage. And scripture says that heaven rejoice when one soul gives their life to Christ. God is interested in one soul and not the crowd. So because it's from one soul that heaven is populated. Absolutely. So you don't need to have a big platform. You don't need to be on CNN. You don't need to you know, be uh, a celebrity, right, to share the gospel. It starts with you. And speaking of platforms from your house, right, from your home, and the gospel is relational. We, the, the reason why Christ died for us is because God loved us, right? He loves us so much that he gave his son. And if we are loving, you know, last month we talked about loving God, like what it means, the, the top two or greatest two commandments, about the love of God. And if we truly love those around us, starting in your home, then you will share the love of God with them, right? If they're not saved. I can add one thing else, and I think it just ties into the need to be uh, ready, you know, prepared and just anticipating opportunities to come. You've seen, I've seen a few eyewitness news situations where someone who witnessed something happen has been interviewed. Um, by a news crew. So they didn't prepare for that to happen, but here they are in front of a camera, and while when they're done narrating, they use that opportunity to say, Jesus loves you, or something like that, throw that in there. So, you know, as much as we don't build, we're building ourselves to where we have a, a bigger reach, it's just that the thing you're doing in, 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 in the dark, more or less like in hiding, that will manifest in the light, right? Um, in all the positive ways. So just preparation would always set you up for when those opportunities come to be able to take it. Absolutely, and as you were saying that, I was reminded of Dick, Brother Emmanuel's um, topic. One of the first, uh, I believe the first truth you shared was get plugged in, right? Get plugged in and living a righteous life as a believer, but you also, I think, ended with give yourself to the word, like whatever. A lot of people are not confident enough to share the, the gospel because they feel like if someone asks a question, they wouldn't ha be able to answer or they wouldn't be able to buttress their point, so they don't share. But when you are ready, when you study the word and you are ready, then when that opportunity comes, however you know spontaneous it is, you'll always be ready. Like we have to stay ready. And um, it was funny, whenever we go to my family, whenever we go out, particularly to Chick-fil-A, my son always gets upset when I don't wind down his window because he always likes to say, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. And I think it's not always, right, even on that platform when you have, I don't know how many seconds they want you to speak. You don't have to say the whole salvation story, right? It's however, and we'll get into what Dick and Uche was teaching us last week, but just simple words like that is enough to minister to someone. Praise the Lord. Right, Emmanuel, you talked about the four truths. So getting plugged in is one of them, living a righteous life as a believer, developing a heart for evangelism, and then partnership with the Holy Spirit. And then you said understand and cherish the role of the Holy Spirit. Why is the Holy Spirit important for, um, for in evangelism? Right? We, are, we do our part. Christ has died. We are sharing. But what is the role of the Holy Spirit? Thank you. Um, you know, the role of the Holy Spirit is so crucial and foundational to anyone giving their life to Christ because we are only witnesses. We're not the ones that make anyone to give their life to Christ. We, just like a witness in, in, a, in, a, in a law court, you give the testimony. You don't make the determination at the end of the day. The judgment also eventually will come either from the jury or if it's a bench trial from the judge. As Christians, our job is to tell about the love of Christ and allow the Holy Spirit, who's the one that waters the seed, to do the job. 
You know, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is the harvester, is the harvester of soul. And Jesus was telling his disciples, he said, he said, the, the, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. I like to say that the Holy Spirit is the force of God. So when God speaks the word, it is the Holy Spirit that goes ahead to execute it. So if we, if we, if we get stuck with the, the, the belief or the, the challenge that, what if I talk to this person and they don't believe? That is not our job because the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts the heart. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit convicts the heart you know, of sinners. So we need the Holy Spirit because we, we are witnesses and simply so. Jesus said to his disciples, go into the world and preach the gospel. He did not say go into the world and get people to repent of their sins. But he said, just minister the word and you allow the Holy Spirit because it's a spiritual thing. Just like Pastor said, you know, salvation is not a religious thing. It is not, it is not you trying to get as many people to make your church uh, be full of members. It is a spiritual thing that many of us sometimes I think, you know, I was asking myself today, do we really understand what salvation means? Because if we do understand, we will know that it is far bigger than us as human beings. You know, if we do understand what heaven and hell is, we would understand that we only are tools in the hands of the almighty God because it's the Holy Spirit that does the finishing work. Praise the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit that does the finishing work. You can just do your part in sowing the seed and you never know when it's going to um, actually manifest. So you do your share. You do your part and let the Holy Spirit do, do his. So we'll get to a, lot, a bulk of Deacon Uche's questions later, but I wanted to take some of the questions here, and I'm going to ask you all to maybe limit your answers to or responses to like a minute because we have a number of things to get through here. One person says, honestly, I think I evangelize, but sometimes get confused on, what, on, did I, on whether or not I did it or did I just talk about how I'm feeling. How do I distinguish between these two? So when they evangelize, they think they're not sure if they really just evangelize or they just talked about how are they feeling at that point in time. So will somebody clarify that for that individual? How do they distinguish between, is there a difference between expressing how you're feeling or is that expressing your feeling, is that evangelism? I mean, expressing how you're feeling about what? Right, so that's a you know. They're gonna say about you know Christ. So I think, like he said, evangelism is really about bearing witness, right? What has God done for you? What's the transformation? I was like this, and this is how I am after I encountered Jesus. Something like that, you know. And if you stick to that without trying to be um, add a little drama, uh, uh, you know, blemish the story so that it's a lot more interesting. It makes it so much easier because you're speaking your truth, right? Your truth is your truth is your truth, regardless of when you're woken up to speak it. So um, expressing your feelings, I can have a conversation with someone about sports and how upset I am or how happy I am. And if I'm not able to translate that to the work of Christ in my life and how that manifests in me being happy and joyful, then all I've done is just express that I'm happy, but what, what, what I maybe have abused that opportunity. You know, so evangelism has to be tied to you in indicating what it is that Christ has done for you, what transformations you've experienced as, a, as, a, as an individual, and what that's leading you towards. You know, and I think that keep it, keep it as simple makes it easy. Absolutely. Transformation, um, I have in my notes, before and after, right? When someone does a makeover, there's a before picture and an after picture. And that's really what we're doing is telling them what Christ did in your life, what you were like before Christ and then after Christ. And if we simplify it to that, regardless of what it is, whether it's relation to sin or to sicknesses, that is witnessing. Because to someone who is in the hospital, it may not be necessarily sin. But if you experience the healing, that's your testimony and that could lead them to Christ. Thank you so much for that. Someone said, you mentioned that telling people to accept God or they will go to hell probably initiates fear, but it's the truth. I know that's the direct approach. So Deacon Uche talked about different approaches. That's the direct approach. Why can't we just say that so people can know about it? It's short, direct, and gets the job done. 
Why is that not such a good choice? I, I, think I, I think I touched on that initially when I was talking about the love of Christ. I, I strongly believe, and scripture is clear, that salvation is not about people going to hell. It's about the love of God. Now, scripture is also clear that whoever does not give their life to Christ, who does not accept the gospel, Jesus was sending his disciples two by two, and he told them, when you go into the city, you preach the, the gospel. Anyone who fails to, to accept the gospel, you dust your sandals and you allow the sand or the dust to remain as a witness in the end on the day of judgment. But the truth of it is that if we go out there and, and want to be straight up and say, hey, you're going to hell if you don't give your life to Christ, I think we're putting the cat before the, before the dog. Is that how they say it? Before the horse. I think we're putting, we're not, we're not going with the message. The message is that God loves us so much that he would shed his son's blood for us. The consequences, because Christ and God gave human beings choice. He has given us a choice. Salvation is about choice. No one is forced to give their life to Christ. So the, 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 the testimony is about the dying, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The consequences of having been forgiven. Because remember, we're fallen initially. That's why we're talking about salvation. We're fallen, we've made a mistake, and we've been forgiven. And we're given a chance to take that forgiveness. And failure to do so comes to consequences, which is not the message. Okay. So direct approach, at least in that way, it is not the best way. Um, Deacon Uche, I'm sorry, I'm going to kind of go over the, the different approaches that you have. So you have the intellectual approach, knowledge of the scriptures. So that would be like quoting a scripture, John 3.16. Then you have the relational approach, which you basically said, uh, said touching their hearts before asking for their hands. Empath empathy oft softens their heart to receive the message. And then there's the service approach. So what would you, I mean, what's your favorite approach to, to evangelize? I think for me, it's just uh, relational, right? Just building that relationship and then find those opportunities to um, sow those seeds, right? Um, but sometimes it's also a combination of multiple different approaches in one. So it's called the three hit combo for those who play games. <laughs> you know, like you put a little, a few combinations, um, you know, maybe while you're serving, you're building a relationship with someone in a volunteer situation, and then you're able to um, minister to them in that regard. Pastor Paul, did you want to add something to that? Um, no, no, you called me, now I gotta say. Uh, I agree, I think this possible one has a default way they go and either way I would just really highly encourage that everyone just have their own go-to place because when you're not in the full gear there's one that you get to but I also think that we all need to be like he said be multifaceted and being able to understand which one applies at with each situation don't don't wait till you get to go serve to talk to the person you have a relationship with, right? So I think I totally agree with what he said in terms of we have to be multifaceted. But if given opportunity, which one are you developing yourself as a purpose, even purposeful evangelism, right? If I may add one thing, um, just going back to the question you asked, uh, uh, Minister Emmanuel, about being direct. Right, and there's a place for that. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's a Bible tells us, I'm looking at First Peter five seven. You know that there's no fear in love, and perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. And sometimes the things that you do from a place of fear has no that wouldn't hold. It's not going to stand, right? Because I, I I can bear witness myself. I've been to a lot of those crusades, and they talk about the burning fire in hell and all, and that's the only reason I came out because I didn't, I, it was scary and I didn't want to imagine myself in there but the, the next day after I got over that fear goes back to status quo, right? So sometimes when you lead in with the f fearful approach you get the response but it's not a response that will stick. So just something to think about. Thank you, that's, that's very, um, that's a very good answer. Um, I wanted to take a couple of more questions before we talk about scenarios and how to overcome certain objections that you may hear. 
Someone said here, if I lead someone to Christ, what is the next thing for me to do or tell them? Well, let me, let me ask this before even that question. Do I have to say a prayer? Is there a certain prayer I have to say to lead someone to Christ? When pastors make the altar call, they say a certain prayer. Do I need to know that? Like, what do I do when it comes to that point where that individual is ready and to receive Christ? Yeah, here's what the question. Here's what I'm going to say. Jesus was on the cross with this man and the one on the right side. And he said, today you're with me in paradise. Did not say utter any prayer. Uh, but because the guy already believed, obviously the guy was going to die anyway. So there's no point coming off the cross to go live. <laughs> but but the reality of it is this. I think it's important because the Bible says go into the world and make disciples of nations. You, you, you keep, it's more than just telling if you can. It's about plugging them in. It's about building them. It's about following, right? Jesus called the disciples. He said, he said follow me, right? Uh, I will make you fishers. So there's, there's always the next step in, in journey because this is a, it's a decision. It's like a child being born and being thrown outside and said, now survive. They have no clue, nothing else, nothing. They have no idea what to do. So I think that it, it's important to start with prayer because one thing that, if you can, if there's room, one thing the prayer does is it brings, it level sets things, it, it becomes genuine. It also teaches them the first prayer if they're not believers. <clears throat> How to pray. It also teaches them the fact that they can pray about anything and and they can start this journey that same way. And then um, I think it's important to to pray with them. And they may be going through things at that moment. And you being the seasoned person or believer can actually pray. Just let me say this. Most of the time when the Bible tells them to go preach the gospel, there's almost always signs and wonders following them. The Bible even says it. It says, this sign shall follow them that believe. Verse 20 of that part of Mark chapter 16. So if you want to see miracles and signs and wonders, share the gospel. Because you see somebody who's sick or who's not feeling well. And you share the gospel and just say, can I pray with you? And God moves in that instant. And they have a tangible understanding of who God really is. Thank you. So when you let someone to Christ, say the prayer they receive Christ into their heart, then what do you do next? Do you just say, okay, bye, see you in heaven? I mean, or come to my church. How do you really, because I mean, it's true. We're, we're telling, we're teaching these things. How do people, how can people really make sure that the seeds they sow really um, does become fruitful or, you know, it develops? I'll start, but I'm sure this gentleman have uh, very great ideas better than what I'm going to be sharing right now. Um, no pressure, but they do have it. So uh, I'll start by the, by saying what I said earlier. I think it's we have to think in terms of discipline rather than just evangelism alone. Yeah, we're going out to tell the gospel, but we also have to make disciples of all nations. And uh, what that means is this: get their number. Ask them if they have a church. Depends on the scenario, right? If you find them in, on, the, on the subway, ask them, hey, listen, why don't I get a number? I'll send you a church around your area. Or, hey, if you if you can go to any church around your area or find a Bible-believing church where the boy, but, but, but the, the, get plugged in because you need to grow. You need to help them see what the next steps are. Hey, listen, this is, it might feel like something is new right now, but in order to keep this fire burning, it's important to get with a believer. Are you okay if I call you next week? Are you okay? And, and like Nikki, what she was saying, that's where some other type of relationship begins, right? Uh, because we have to crawl and walk, but to crawl, we stumble sometimes. And so scripture is clear about us being able to make sure that these people, our 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 seed is planted and it, it grows or germinates. And, and you may not be able to do the one, the, the watering, but you've done the planting. So, but make sure they have somebody who does the watering. Awesome. Anything to add to that, gentlemen? Just I, I strongly believe that, agreeing with Pastor, it depends on the relationship and the circumstance. Now, if it is someone that you, someone you have contact with, someone that you would see tomorrow, um, I think it's important that you 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 build that close relationship where you 
you help disciple that person, which is one of the ways to do that is to teach them. If, they, if, if they've not had true relationship with God before, they probably would not know how to go to God in prayers and teach them how to pray. First of all, teach them how to believe because they believe through salvation, they must continue to grow in that realm of faith because everything you would do as a Christian will come with your faith in God. Another thing that is important for new believers that I, I believe is that we must also demystify what the work, our work with God, W-A-L-K means, our work with God. We must make new believers understand that they will not be changed in all their lifestyle overnight because they just said the prayer of salvation. So it is okay to grow from one stage to another. It comes with, you know, um, of giving your life to Christ, justification and transformation and glorification. So with time, we have to, as Christians or as one who is discipling a new believer, we have to bring them to the place to know that, yes, like Paul said, some believers are babies. They, they can only take milk. You grow to the level where you eat flesh. And at some point, you begin to crack bone. It's in scripture. So we have to teach them the, the growth process and the fact that I know you used to smoke, I know you used to um, cheat, but I, I know that God is able to help you grow through the process. Because one thing I've, I have found personally is that for new believers, the devil cheats them by saying, oh, that thing is not real. You, you used to smoke, but you just smoked again, right? Why do you think that Christ has actually redeemed you? So making them understand that, yes, the place of prayer, but it is important to know that transformation comes with growth and it is a process awesome thank you so much anything to add just um to buttress what i said i think it's very crucial right because um i was listening to someone i think it was simon sinek today and he was talking about how when you put your mind to do something right you want to go walk out or you, you want to start a new workout regimen you go to the gym the first day you know, and the guy who's motivated you is this bulky, you know, muscled guy, right? And you go to the gym the first day and nothing changes. You go to the second day, nothing changes. The third day, nothing changes. And like, you, you, you're disappointed. You stop going. Um, but the guy didn't tell you that it took him 15 years to look the way he's looking. In the same way, a Christian who's just a new convert has to understand that those desires are not just going to die off immediately. It's just with the closeness you get to God, the, the farther away you are from those desires. So it's a gradual process. And in that, setting that expectation would re remove any form of disappointment that they may feel. So that when the accuser of the brethren comes, they're able to say, yeah, I'm still a work, it's still a, a work in progress, right? And not be discouraged by where they currently are. Let me add to that. He inspired something in me. The Bible says, Jesus, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, is based on the shame, right? And and so I would add to what they just said here. Sometimes when, or when we share the gospel, we should also let people know what they, who they are now in Christ and what it means to know God. Because some people are going through so many, so many challenges, right? And they, they're hopeless, Right, but let's, the salvation should not only just be because we are, we are, um, you're going to make it to heaven one day, but really, what does God have for me now? How can He help me through what I'm going through right now? And so, we need to help people understand that it's not a mythical, mysterious, theological, it's a practical relationship with God, and that's where the transformation begins. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I'm going to encourage those that are here in the auditorium to, um, you know, raise your hand if you have questions and we'll take them live. But let's get into the practicalities, right? So we've learned the importance of, of sharing the, um, the gospel, the good news. We know what it is. We, we are ready. We stay prepared. And then the opportunity comes. So now you have someone that you are ministering to or, you know, evangelizing to. And you ask, are you ready to give your life, for example? We're going to go through some of the questions that, you know, some of the things that may come up, objections. So what if they say, I'm not ready? What do you, what would be your response? And if you all have ha had objections that you want to share and you want to address, please go ahead 
and answer or ask rather. One should have objection because two weeks ago you all committed to share the gospel. So somebody must have said something back at you. So you should know, you know, what was your answer. You know, so we should have objection. So go ahead. I would say if somebody tells me, and I've heard people say that before, um, this is not for me, or I'm not ready now with the question that you have asked. The Bible says we should speak the truth in love, which is do not get offended and do not feel like you have not accomplished the mission. Because it is important for us to know that evangelism is about witnessing. The fact that the person tells you, oh, I'm not ready, you could reply by saying that, yes, I understand that you're not ready, but I, I, I want to leave you with this thought. I want to leave you with this thought that God sent his only son to die for you. Just think about it for a moment that someone would give their life just for you, that yours might be saved. And, you know, leave them with that thought. And it's an open-ended question is always very powerful because even when you are gone, that person is still thinking. And in, in the process of their thinking, the Holy Spirit has the opportunity to come into their life. And that's a very good point. And I think it, it that's a go ahead. I think as you say that, it's very important not to get into an argument because again, you say, oh, you're not, you're not ready. Well, you'll go to hell or, you know, just really avoid that because then it defeats the purpose, the trap. Yeah, I say that's a very good one. I actually like that. I think, uh, honestly, just ask the question, why? Uh, I'm not ready. Why? What, what's, what's stopping you? From, do you understand what we talked about and why? I mean, like you're right, Lisa, we're not pushing and we must be prepared to stop. But we should also follow up and say, I, you know, like he said, leave something in their mind and say, would it be okay if I call you next week or two weeks? Later? And if God is working on them, that call might be the lifesaver or they might call you before that time. But you've done your part of it. Or you could go to the dark side. And, and pull the emotional strings, right? You know, like, you know, you don't own your life. You don't know when it's going to happen. If you step out of here, you could get run over by a car. <laughs> <laughs> and so on and so on. But, but in all honesty, right, it's, it should never be adversarial. Because um, people get pulled into the emotions sometimes. Like, it becomes, oh, my objective is to save somebody today. And you're so driven by that that you start, you're almost willing to get into a fight just so that you can have that salvation. So it's, it's witnessing, but do it with love. And the person says, I don't want to listen anymore. I don't have time. I'm not ready yet. You know, just say a prayer with them or for them and just move it, move it along. Because your walk is, you know, Paul planted, Apollos watered. It's God who gave the increase. And if you keep that in mind, you will never be upset. Amen. So I'll, I'll start this question with you, or rather I'll have you start, Deacon Uche. So the person says, well, you know, I've always been, I grew up in church and, you know, I did all of that, but I really don't understand why you want me to accept Jesus as my savior. But if God loves us so much that he gave his son, why will a loving God send people to hell? Like why, why, if God loves us so much, why can't we all just go to heaven? Like, why do we even need this? What would you say? He has no answer yet to answer <laughs> the question. Let's wait for his answer and then we'll round, give a round of applause. Praise the Lord. I mean, the, the, the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? That's a basic tenets of, you know, where our faith is, is, is um, pinned on, you know, and is that acknowledging that I'm a sinner regardless. And if I've never made that confession, I think in Romans 10, 10, 10, 9, you know, where he says, um, the word is near to you in your, in your heart. And we all know that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved for with the heart one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, uh, confession is made unto salvation. So the, the, the fact that you've grown, you grew up in a Christian household, like most of us that were born into a Christian household, does not translate to you being born again because it's a personal relationship that you're going to have to build and have and it's a confession you have to make for yourself 
right? And, you know, the, the world is indeed fallen. Why would a God who is so full of love allow people to go to hell? Because we have free will, right? You have free will to make whatever decision you want to make, and it's not, nobody's going to put a gun to your head. It has to be uh, uh, a situation you embrace on your own because your parents cannot make you, cannot be born again on your behalf. Nobody can do it. It's a personal race that we're all running, you know? So... Just that understanding that is, we have free will and we make decisions uh, however we're led, but it's important that we come to a point in our lives where we have to embrace the salvation and the grace that God has made available for our own selves. Awesome. I think it's also important to, just to shed light today, it's important to know that God is holy. Scripture tells us and God is loving. God is kind. Now, God is all of this good thing, but there's still, when there's love, there's an opposite of it. God does not behold sin. Even to Jesus Christ himself, when he was carrying this weight of the sins of the world, Scripture tells us that God could not stand it, right? Now, God is in heaven in a perfect place that has been designed for only the perfect people, not people in our human body, but the Bible tells us about the bride and the the bridegroom. Now, God does not hate us and wants us to go to hell, but he has prepared a perfect place in heaven. The scripture tells us heaven is built with, with gold. It's a perfect place where God reigns. And God cannot take the dirtiness of sin to contaminate heaven. And so God is not rejecting us as a person, but what God rejects is the sin that man refuses when man refuses to give their life to christ and god i don't think that god will be because he's so loving it's like somebody who wears a white dress and say because they 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 love everyone around and they're going about you know picking dates and staining the white cloth that might not be a best analogy but heaven is a perfect place for only perfect beings and that is why we must be transformed from our corruptible body before we can get into the perfect place which is where god dwells and I, I, I'd say when you mean perfect, you mean transformed beings, those who have been transformed by the blood, not out of our own works. Of course. Okay. Um, I, I totally agree with what, what my brothers have shared here. And I would probably say another thing is, is you know, that you hear all the time, you know, why does God allow evil to happen? And why, why would the loving God let someone go to hell? And I think it's important to spin that for what it is. And say, like he said, we have a we we have a will. You don't let everybody go into come into your house just because it's it's a house. I think we should spin around and say, but that's not what God's intention. God actually wants everybody to come to him. Uh, and tell people so it's not, he's not sending anyone to hell. He's only people who choose not to come invariably choose. Yeah, it, it choose to go that way because you have the free will, but you're choosing not to. And then spin and let them know Jesus sent his son. God sent a son to die for you and made a sacrifice to give you that access that you can make the decision to accept him. And then you will never have to go to hell. He has never, he didn't create hell for anybody. He created it for the fallen angels and those who have been deceived and followed the fallen angel as the devil. But it's important for us to spin around and tell them, no, God actually wants people saved. That's why he sent his son to die for you. But you also have to make a decision to want to come to him. Would you like to come to him? So I spun around and preached gospel in the middle of that. So let's say this person buys that and then says, well, you know, you say preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. I know a Christian, I, I knew a Christian, and that person did me wrong. Their lifestyle was nothing like what it should be. Why should I become, why should I become a Christian? This person hurt me. Why should I be like them? You had one that initiated the discussion. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I think that's really where that was coming from, right? That text that you just quoted. And again, whoever they're attributing it to is not the person that said it. But bottom line is, live a life that is worthy of emulation. 
you know, because I can't tell you, uh, I can't talk about love, 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 and everything that I manifest is hate. I can't tell you that it's important to be kind, and I don't have a, a, string, a, string, a string of kindness in my life. You know, I can't tell you that, you know, you have to be someone who's led by the Spirit and be humble, and there's no humility in my life. So the things that we allow, when we allow the Holy Spirit to fully manifest in our lives and take hold of us and yield ourselves completely to him, then people see us sometimes. I think that's where that's coming from. When someone sees you, how you behave in certain situations and how you respond to stress and stressful situations, and they come to you and say, how are you able to do this, right? I'd like to understand, can you help me get to where you are? And then that's where, if, if you have to preach, um, use words if necessary comes from, I think. You know, so you you can't you can't tell someone to, you know, the we when it comes to parenting, they say children a lot is caught than is taught, right? It's not do as I say, but not as I do. It should be do as I do, right? And and they also it also it, it can translate as well to our life as a Christian. And I think there's a question. My there mistake. They're actually there. combined two thoughts, but thank you. Hi, I have a question. So in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So when I preach the gospel in you know, an evangelist type of way about the death and resurrection of Jesus, um, my question is, for example, the scenario is I was preaching it to a homeless person. And he said, I believe in Jesus, but look at my circumstances. Look at where I'm living. So in that particular case, what do those verses mean, kingdom of God versus Jesus Christ, the resurrection and salvation? And how can his circumstances change when he asks me that question? Thank you. Can I ask you a question? What was your response? My response was that um, since he believed in Jesus Christ, that was the first step. And um, believing and then uh, God's aware of his circumstances in a situation and that he should find a local church to get support. And God would guide his steps. That's what scripture, scripture says. So that he would guide his steps, go to the nearest church, and go in and um, go to the altar and pray. Thank you. And, you know, that is, that's a good response, but I would like it's to... It's actually a very good response. I, I, one of the things I want us to be really careful when speaking the gospel is, is we know everything with what God says, but it's still a personal relationship. Being a Christian does not make man make all the right decisions. Sometimes we get so selfish in our ways that we make decisions that lead us into a different place. And that's why growth and being plugged in the church and, and having a place where we don't take one part of the scripture alone, but rather the holistic part of the scripture. But like you said, it's accepting God is the first step. Uh, I accept that God does not mean I have to, I wouldn't go study, wouldn't go read my Bible, wouldn't even go to work. If I do not work, I would not eat. One of the things that, and I bring for you, or I'm thankful that you, you didn't, you, you gave that realistic, practical approach as well, is one of the things that happens is sometimes we preach a gospel and we tell people now that, you know, Jesus, life has changed, everything's going to be great, and everything's going to be turned. Truly, God says we're going to face challenges in this world. But I was talking to someone recently, I said, sometimes they'll say, people will hear the word, or people say to us, um, um, uh, you know, why would God do this or why would God or it's not okay for, for people to do this one and I said sometimes it's not about why would God sometimes is the Bible says sometimes he lets certain things happen so that he can prune, prune us he can shape us out he I said he let happen not because he's gonna forget us but a lot of times I wish to tell people that even when I go through the valley of a shadow of death being a believer makes me know that He's there. There's going to be an other side. And let me put it another way. The way we believe the gospel is also important because some people preach the gospel of receive it and everything's going to be okay. Um, that's great. 
But would you tell them how it's going to be okay? Would you lead them in how it's going to be okay? Would you show them what God really wants for them? But they have to daily make the decision to walk this walk with God. The Bible says that if we have to daily crucify ourselves, it's not a gospel of convenience. It's a gospel of total surrender, total yielding to the Holy Spirit. And when we begin to let go of our own, what we think is going to fix it to how and listen and pray and get in the company of believers that will guide you, then you realize that lives begin, God begins to work in you and, and you will be a testimony to them. There's sometimes miracles happen now where he was he was he was blind now he sees as a believer but there's sometimes where these things take a process and that's why jesus did it many miracles in different ways i want to use this example um um he alluded me just now um the example of cornelius who was um is it cornelius uh yeah, who was in, 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 in the early church that even though he was serving God the way he could and he was wealthy and he was serving God, he was paying his, his giving to the church, God spoke to him to send for Peter and God also spoke to Peter to come back and minister what it means to grow in the Lord. Now, he was already doing that, but he felt something was missing. So this Christianity, this love, it's a, it's a growth process. And sometimes God, you would pray with them and God would change things. And sometimes God would make them walk through because walking through allows you to let go of what is not okay and embrace what he has to give. Because most people get to go with God with an idol with them. And sometimes God just wants to say, let go of that idol and let me help you. So I thought was, what you did was really, really great. Encouraging them to find the Bible-based church, um, a, a Bible-based church, and also to get with a company of believers. Sorry, I, I remember the story. There's this guy who was a drug addict who gave his life to Christ, but went and did drugs, went to jail. And went to jail, did drugs after he was a believer, went to jail. Consequences, decisions, consequences. It was in jail where he, his wife left him, everyone left him. It was, it was in jail where he got his real true understanding of who he was as a believer. And then he came out this time. This time I said, when he came out, he said, I'm not going to go back to my home where I still have to uh, drink and, and do drugs. He was chief drug dealer he said i'm going to make a decision to go to church while he went to church while sitting in the place in church first time i came up was met with a couple the couple said hey how are you doing it's first time would you like to go have lunch with me it was when they followed him took him to go have lunch that they began to help him grow sooner or later he started coming to their home for training and for small groups and things like that before you knew it the life began to change he went back to the the whole city, because it was a known drug dealer, the whole city became changed. That the mayor, even and the drug dealers were saying, Ah, I know you, right? What happened? They began to change that even the mayor gave him the key to the city and named something after him because of the transformation. But that transformation that happened immediately, it happened over time because people were still ensuring that he was a disciple, not just evangelism. I don't know if that helps so we have we're running out of time we have a few questions coming in from online so the one i have here says i have an episode with a patient who felt so disappointed that she worked so hard to get a promotion and she wasn't given the promotion rather what it was given to someone who quit a while ago and she had issues with the person that was given that promotion she was crying and threatening to commit suicide i tried talking her talking to her about the purpose of god and she told me to keep it in my pocket that white people brought Christianity, and what right do I have to talk to her about a story that I don't know the origin? What can I do at that point? You can pray for them. You know, it is important that we understand that the place of prayer is about the first place where we win souls for Christ because we have to prepare in prayers, we can prepare the hearts of those that we are going to share with um, God's word too. Now, there are different ways we evangelize and or win souls of Christ. 
and prayer is one of the one of the very veritable tool that we could use. That kind of person in that situation, there's almost nothing you can tell them at that time that would change their mind or would soften their heart. But you could do one thing, which is you could pray for them because in the realm of prayer, everyone is submissive to the higher power, which is God. I, I totally agree um, because it, it's not chastising. It's not, I mean, especially when they're at the point of suicide and things like that. I think it's just just taking them to a point of just, listen, let's pray. I may not know how or why those things are happening, but if you allow me to pray uh, with you, and then we can, you know, that's what I know to do in situations like this, and that's where your story and your opportunity to share your story may come. You don't have to share it there, but you just sow a seed of, this is what I know how to do in moments like this, and then you begin to pray. Amen. Oh, same question, okay. The question I have here, another question says, what if you have tried to witness in the past and the person got turned off? How do you try again when it seems like the other person isn't willing to listen to you? Almost like they can't get past your past failures to see that you are different now. How do you handle that? Person get, got turned off. If it, you've tried to witness in the past and the person got turned off, um, it's, it's almost like the person knew who you, your, who you, you were, like okay. your past failures, and that's hindering that conversation. Yeah, and it goes back to just showing the transformation that you've experienced, right? So you don't force the situation, but just continue to show them that if I used to be an angry person, I'm no longer angry. You know, I used to be like this, I'm no longer like, just begin to, again, witness to them based on your own uh, transformation. And over time, that would, and, and with prayer as well, over time, that would turn them over. I, I remember, you know, a lot of situations where uh, a couple, like a husband and a wife, were going through a difficulty, maybe the wife is born again and the husband isn't. You know, and pastors would advise, listen, just keep being submissive, praying for the man, and living your life as a Christian, letting the transformation that you've experienced shine through. And over time, the husband is eventually, you know, reconciled with Christ because of what they've seen in your own life. So we're almost out of time. If anyone has any burning questions, we'll take it. But the last question I have here says, as a Christian, if I do not engage in evangelism, are there consequences for me? Does it make me any less of a Christian? If I don't evangelize, are there The way I look at it is disobedience. Uh, it is a command from Christ, Jesus himself. Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, the opposite of that is not doing what Christ has commanded. You know, there's so many things in scriptures that are not directly from the words of Jesus Christ himself. As much as the scripture is inspired by the Holy Ghost, you know, I personally take the words that came out from the mouth of Jesus, you know, without any form of um, levity, right? Now, Jesus is the one who said, go into the world. The failure to do that, it's, in my opinion, is disobedience. But I, I don't know if I have the answer because I have not seen the end to know whether failure to, to share the gospel is sufficient to make anyone not to enter heaven. But I've heard preachers and people say, that in heaven, there are many mansions and our crowns, some of our crowns will be bigger than the others because of how much we souls that were won. But one last thing I'd like to say is compassion. is very important when we share the gospel, compassion. Like she was talking about, sometimes we are always in a hurry to share the gospel religiously and leave. But there are many people who need our compassion as the, as the, the, the foundation for them to give their life to Christ. Like the homeless man, we should not always be too much in a hurry and say, I've told you about Jesus Christ, and it's up to you to give your life. What he needs at that time, scripture records, there's one that comes to his brother, he needs food, and you tell him, yeah, go, God will bless you. But that's not what he needed at the time. As we should be versatile as believers and be ready to use every resource available, and sometimes it is compassion. Perfect. Absolutely. I, I agree. Um, uh, what was the last question you said about that again? Yeah, well, you know, I think you answered it perfectly well. Here's the thing. Look at this. Jesus said, let me go back to what I said, John 17. God said, I sent him. He said, I've done what you did for me. 
I am sending this as well. Don't be selfish. Someone came and died for you and gave you this big meal. You're now in the mansion and you're looking at people outside who are in the dirty mud and you're going to them, <laughs> I'm in the mansion, I'm in the palace, you're out there. What he said is, I saved you so that you also can go outside and save those other people. I think it's just selfishness. I think it's just um, about self-centeredness um, and, and self-ambition because freely you have received, freely you have to give. And so it's important for us to understand that it is an act of disobedience when we do not do that because that's the only reason you are not dead today is so that you can share the gospel. Sorry, I have a quick question. Or more like a comment. So what do you do when the person you're trying to share the gospel with does not feel that they have a problem or does not feel that they have anything worth or going on in their life that would necessitate them even listening to you and saying that God, or G, um, Jesus, you know, came to die for them. Career is going well. They have no problem, literally. And I have a a real life situation with one of my brothers. And what do you, in terms of, um, like, what can they, can they look at? Because it's based on the results that you produce that will draw people to you. And those results would come from you spending, paying the, paying the price of being in this presence. And that is what the world is looking, looking at us. You know, what do we have? Um, you're saying that Christ is this. I mean, my life is going okay. Do I really need your Christ? <laughs> I think the story of, the story of um, Lazarus and the rich fool, it's uh, instructive in, in this direction. There's a lot of people, I know a lot of people who are rich and they don't think that, they think like you said, everything is going well. Hence, they don't think there's anything that you can, that your, your, that your Jesus can give to them. But, you know, making such person understand that salvation is about your soul, not what you have, not your, in the, salvation is not in the physical realm, it's a spiritual thing. So the question is, when you die, you could leave people with this kind of question. When you die or after now, where do, does your soul go to? And that question is bigger than Big Gates or Mike Zuckerberg or anything because at the end of the day, when we all leave this earth, we are laid to rest in the same way. There's no difference. Some people are putting caskets and billions, and, but in the end, when you go there 50 years to come, the casket or whatever way they were celebrated is destroyed, and the only thing that is found is their bones. So... Asking that person, where does your soul go after now? It's, I think that's how I would look at it because it's really, salvation is not really about money. It's not about your career or what you have. The rich fool regretted in, in the end because the poor, apparently, quote unquote, the poor Lazarus entered into the kingdom and the question was, who laughed last, sometimes laughed best? So it's just like telling someone, oh, you need to eat this to grow. And they just, they don't understand it, you know. So. And I think that's where prayer, there's no one way, like we've said over and over again, there's no one way to evangelize and leaving people with such questions and going to God. Every time you, you evangelize to somebody, I think you have a responsibility as a believer to follow up in prayers because like we say, like scriptures say, Paul planted Apollo water. The increase will always come from God. And so handing such person to God should be the next thing to do. Wow, there's a question. Wow. Okay. Go ahead. Um, how would you respond to someone who says they have a hard time believing God because they don't understand why he would let innocent people die? 
why babies would suffer and die from cancer. God show up here and answer this question. Um, truth, truth be told, um, let, let, uh, there, there's so many things we can go on. Uh, we can we can spin in different ways. I like that question. I think it's a very good question, but I'm going to try to take it um, as simplistic as I can. God loves us. And the same thing you hear people say things like, you know, why is there so many wars? God does not start the wars. People start the wars in general. And we as human beings, there's some things we may not have an answer for entirely. Like, why does a baby who was born yesterday, why does it die of cancer? I do not know. I, I do not understand that myself. I do not know. But here's one thing I know. I believe that God can heal that baby. I believe that God could heal that baby. I believe that we as Christians have to rise up to the place and live the life that God wants us to live so that we can, may not heal all of them, but step out there and heal one. And just, just one, one can bring about salvation of many. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So we need to just stick beyond just the fact that we're saved and believers going to heaven. But we should ask God, what is your purpose on earth? So maybe someone has a sign. Someone was gifted with something to be able to see that and heal that baby uh, by the power in Jesus' name. And they just didn't stand up to that. I, I, I cannot answer some of that kind of a question in that regard of who may have done that. But I believe something that God wants to heal that baby. He doesn't want them to suffer. It doesn't want them. But here's the other thing I'll say. Uh, the human beings, as human beings, some of the things the parents may have done while they were pregnant constitutes or contributes to some of those things. Some of them you know, might not be the fault, but some of those things also come to what they may have gone through, um, um, gone through or what they went through. And, and, and that could add, like I said, there's so many different facets. One of the things I hate doing is doing a what if and try to justify God in that way. I, I would never. I mean, look at this point. point. Solomon, before Solomon was the son that um, um, David had, David prayed and fasted for that. But God it said, this son is not going to live. This, this son, right? It's not going to live. It's not going to live. Now, why God did that? I do not know. Why did God say one, uh, two nations, one I loved, Israel loved, Jacob I hated? I, I do not know that. But bigger than any decisions I can see in the minuscule mind of my own understanding is an infinite God that sees it entirely and sees the entirety of things. I've heard some people say, well, you know, um, if some people pray, Lord, if I'm going to sin tomorrow, take me out today. If I'm going to miss my place tomorrow, take me out today. And, and why God will decide and say or allow certain things to happen all the time, we may not fully know. And I think it will be um, it will be will be untrue if we say we know that that makes us God. There's some things we'll be able to sit down with him and say, Lord, why did this happen? And it may not make sense to us today, but when we sit with him and we understand this rationale, when we get to heaven, he will put that in place and let us know. Look at your kids when you tell them something today and say, go ahead and do this. And they may not understand, but they get to be older and they understand why you made such very difficult decisions. I look at that and say, God, I may not understand anything, but I also know that you're here with me. One great thing I like about that question is this. Number one, it also tells us that we can raise a hand and we can be that vessel that God wants to use to heal. The other thing I like about that question is the fact that it also speaks to our heart that we should be, you know, some of us may have gone through that same thing and the world is watching how did you handle it? How did you get through it? What, what did you, what made you stand up? How are you living through this? And, and they see joy in your hearts. I'm not saying anyone's here, but you see joy in your heart, see life in you. And they say, I didn't even go through half of this and, and I don't have this joy. 
show me how to have this joy um, that you have. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So sometimes the, the, the whole thing is bigger than just what we can um, on, on the why questions with God. It's very difficult to answer, uh, but what we know is what we know. And sometimes we wouldn't even know. God reveals it to us down the line, and he brings it back and says, remember this thing that happened. This is for this reason. Uh, I, I knew about it or I did not know about it. I, I'm a person, like he said, who believes the entirety of what the Word of God says. And I believe he can heal as much as I know that he can use us and he can walk through us through difficult times as well, too. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Hope you all enjoy that. Give him a round of applause. First and foremost, I want to say a very big thank you to everyone who's joined us. This is, I think, the latest we've been. Um, we're going to tweak it so that we can, but we can be able to pull back our time. But I appreciate everyone for what, for the questions. Uh, I want to bring something back to what you said in terms of, um, um, what was that thing about um, my life, right? And, and, and I believe God, right? And look at where I am as well, too. I, 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 there's one thing that dropped in my heart. The Bible, and I'm going to answer that question as well. It's something you said. The Bible says that um, um, even the devil believes God. Even the devil believes there is a God uh, true. Uh, and the reality is that if we and when we believe God, it's okay to pull back with a person and ask a question. Help me understand what you mean by you believe God. Uh, believe God. Because the devil does that too. But the believing God is what the one you did to tell them that this more than just I believe there's a follow me part of I believe. Do you understand what I'm saying? And which is what you did. Say, so listen, there's a follow me part. Because I believe God is one thing and we still go to our old nature, our old self. And, and you can, the Bible says seed harvest always comes. Uh, if we don't do things according to what we believe, then we may not enjoy everything involved in that. And, and it's the same thing where people will say that, that I'm, a, I'm a believer, I'm a child of God, and, and this does not mean this should not happen to me. No, you, you, you're a child of God, you're a believer. Um, but sometimes these things happen so that his name can be glorified in the middle of that thing. And we may not understand why, but his name can be glorified. But at the same time, in the same way people look at, I, I'm not a very great person where, uh, and understand that the theology of the Bible, the theology people have these days is, if you believe God, you're supposed to be poor because of some, that, that's not scriptural in my, my Bible. I've read the Bible. It is not scriptural. It's my fact, if, if we don't give to the poor, who else should give to the poor? Who else should show love if we don't do that? So, uh, you know, if we, if our heart is right, then our money will do the right things. But if our heart is not right, then we would use the money to satisfy us. But if our heart is right, God will use us to realize that he blessed us so we can be a blessing. And sometimes miracles as good as you, we all are a miracle to somebody. Is as good as somebody say, saying, I have not eaten yesterday. And you say, come, let me take you to a restaurant. I've not, I've not paid this one. Come, let me give you this $15. That's a miracle. So you have no idea you're proving to them God exists. By just those small little tiny uh, acts there. And, and there was a question about this. And I think Brother Mano brought it up about your brother there. Um, about brother and, and those who don't feel like they need God. Uh, it so reminds me of, uh, my, I'm reminded of a story of Kenneth he again, his brother-in-law was almost the same thing. And he was thinking the same thing that, hey, this is it. And I think he was burdened. And, and he said he prayed for is prayed for the man. In the Bible, I think it's the book of Corinthians or John, one of them, it says that who the God of this world has blinded their eyes. And he said it right, a spiritual thing. So we said, listen, God, every blindfold that's making someone think they're self-sufficient, Lord, remove it. And he said he prayed a prayer one time, and three weeks later, that man gave his life to Christ um, because of that. So we also have to take authority uh, of anything that may be distraction in the lives of people as they go on does that does that help amen you know i i thank god for the night and i always joyful i'm always excited about the forum it's a time where we share this moment and hear the truths very practical very relevant so that we don't just share the bible for what the bible is but how we can take it into the world 
uh, please don't don't hesitate to keep sharing the God, word of God, sharing the gospel, and also don't hesitate to keep sending the questions in. We're going to start our new series next month and, and be plugged in and, and let's go out and be the arms and legs and be followers of Christ, making disciples of nations.